way it's going to work. They're going to have five minutes to give you their first impression of the film. Um, then five minutes to go back and you know discuss anything that maybe someone uh, may have brought up within the panel, and then we'll open it up so that you can get your thoughts out and um, and you know talk up, talk about, think about what you're feeling, what you're thinking, what this movie has awoken in you. Um, would you like the microphone or? Think? Can you hear us okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, would anyone like to go first? Uh, I'll I'll jump in. Uh, this is going to sound odd. In some ways, this is like Do the Right Thing, uh, a 1989 movie by Spike Lee. And that's because in that movie, there was red in every scene. And there really is, with the possible exception of a few key sequences, there is the color red in every single scene, whether it's clothing, the tint of their faces and hands and bodies, which somehow seem to be heightened a little bit more by the filmmakers, but probably also capturing, capturing the natural landscape. Um, and certainly nature itself. So I thought that was very intriguing to me. Uh, and it's also, to me, a film about time. Early on he says, what are you going to do next month? What are you going to do? Are you going to do anything? Uh, and so, for the central character, time is really running out. So time is important to him and the need to go there out west somewhere west for an answer or for peace and i think the last two spoken words okay okay is the acceptance of this is going to happen there's nothing i can do about it but at least i've made the most i didn't just stay in a hospital bed i saw i loved because obviously it was a love relationship between him and the, the woman. Uh, and so he, he went someplace out there to die, which I know is, and I'm remembering this from a documentary I once saw on death, that in some cultures, you don't do what we do in this country or do traditionally in the West. In some cultures, you go someplace and you get left to become part of nature again. Um, and so obviously there are a lot of symbols, a lot of visuals. I was always intrigued by it, but I saw also found it sometimes hard to watch. Um, and I also think it was really the story of the con man who was compelled to change, who was very unlikable <laughs> within the first five minutes but then becomes a friend and they bond and he is there at the last minute. And that's probably something that that guy never signed up for, but it just happened, he was compelled. So I think that sometimes that happens, right? You're faced with a situation, you just don't know where it's gonna go. And before you know, you've gone some journey, you've gone through some trek, some change somehow that you never expected and it kind of changes you forever. So that's really what I got. Um, you know, very, very interesting, very intriguing film. And it took me a while to realize why sometimes things were fuzzy and why sometimes things were clear, but more and more it was the point of view of Ian, I guess, that that's what happens to you when you were going through that, that trauma. So uh, quite, quite a piece, I thought. Um. I, I, I wrote a lot, kind of just jotted some notes down. Um, I usually like when I'm, when I'm on the panel, I like to kind of do, you know, what I thought about the film process and then also kind of what I got out of the story in terms of, you know, spiritual elements out of it. Um, they shot this film in sequence. This shot was shot all in sequence. They packed a, uh, they just lived in an RV for like four to six weeks with the entire cast. Uh, of just the four actors and the director and uh, one of the crew members. That was it. So it was only six people traveling for six weeks around the entire United States. I think the director said they covered 46,000 miles uh, of track. Um, and so they shot it in sequence and the director said that they, you know, what was on paper in the beginning completely changed because it changed uh, the different scenery that they were at. They would keep changing the story, um, you know, using different elements. Um, as Jim said, it is about time, 
And the way that they show that through the film is, uh, I think four or five times, you have time lapses. Yeah. You know, you have, uh, I think the first one was at the gas station, right? Um, and then they just, they sit the camera down and they just lapse the time by, uh, for you. Um, and that happens several different times and it does show, you know, that time is running out, you know, that he doesn't have much time left. Um, so it's a, it's a really cool visual effect to kind of get that message across. Um, another thing that I notice a lot, every time Ian would go out and throw up or would, would just kind of be on his own, they would cut to a shot, you would still hear the audio of him throwing up, but they cut to a shot where he's standing there and you have these orbs around him. Um, and for me, you know, we, every time we see pictures, people are like, oh, angels, those are angels, you know, like those are little orbs. But I think they were trying to go with that element that Ian is, is surrounded by a spiritual entity that he's really not alone on this journey that he's portraying, that he thinks he's going on. Um, and they do that several times throughout. Um, and they actually begin to increase. The very last one, if you notice that last shot, the orb was piercing right through his vision, right through his eye, outwards into that eternal, uh, uh, that eternal, you know, endless uh, abyss, you know, out there. <laughs> um, and then I also found, um, going to more into the story, that a lot of the things, a lot of the shots they shot were kind of in the beginning more isolation, more desert, um, and then as he started adding people. Things got a little greener, then um, they started showing uh, community, they started showing the trains. So I thought that uh, it really started beginning as a story of isolation to family. Because it, you know, it was really nice to see them all eating dinner together, right? So Ian was trying to isolate himself, and I think God had another plan for him, saying, well, you want to go out there and you want to you die, however, you, you can't do that on your own. You know, you need, you need to have a family, and I think, you know, that, that's what it's about. And if you're not going to look for it, I'm going to give you the people that are going to be there to take care of you. Um, so I think he went from isolation to community to family. Um, and then it seems like it starts going down, like, okay, well, the girls leave, um, and then he leaves them out there. So, oh, is he isolated again? I don't think so. The, 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 what I read, the movie that I thought of was uh, Return of the King. Um, if anybody has seen Return of the King, the very last shot of Return of the King is when the elves get on the, uh, the boat and they travel west. And where is west? West, as, um, as J.R.R. Tolkien saw it, was heaven. West was that, that, that world that, that is beyond us, you know, that we can't see. And the visual in, in Return of the King is, is just like that. It's, they're, they're literally on the boat and they're traveling. You can't see anything that's out there. You just see it you know, disappear in the horizon. Same thing here, that, that uh, Ryan was taking his friend into eternity. You know, he, was, he, was, he had to, to take that trip, that voyage with him, and he couldn't stay you know, because Ryan's time wasn't, wasn't his time. But Ian needed someone to take him there because he couldn't do it on his own. Um, the, and I love Lord of the Rings, that's why I thought of it. Um, because the movie is a lot about death, but I also think it's about life. Um, in Lord of the Rings, uh, Gandalf says that, you know, there's the big battles happening, it looks like they're all going to die. And he says, death is just another path, one that we all must take. The black rain cloud of this world rolls up, and then you see it. And then Pippin is like, well, what, what do you see, Gandalf? He says, white shores and beyond. And I love that image, and I think that's the image we get here, white shores and beyond. And this is, I think it's a salt, uh, a salt flat that they're on. Um, so I think of the words that, of Jesus, you know, you are the salt of the earth. You know, so there's a lot of, like, hidden images here that I think could, could be played in a, in a spiritual sense. Um, I think it, was, it's, it's, it is a tough shot to watch, you know, a minute and a half, two minutes of the same shot. It's difficult. I think it works. I, I was really excited when I saw it. I was like, wow, this is really intriguing. I'm interested. Um, and it let me, I, I could just sit there and think for a little um, and reflect upon the entire film and how it was leading up to this moment. So I really liked it. Um, and the name Ian, if you don't know what it means, it means God forgives. God is forgiving. Um, and I think Ian had that struggle that he couldn't accept his condition. Um, and in, in his own identity, his name, was who God is. God is forgiving. God forgives. Yet he couldn't get past that because he, he, he himself couldn't be forgiving to God because he was... And he kept searching. He kept searching. Um, but I think in the end when he says, okay, he forgave. 
and he says, okay, I, can, I accept it. I accept that, that this has happened, and I accept that, that this is the place where, where I need to be. You know, if you realize he couldn't see, remember he was blind, how did he know that that was the right spot? And for me, that's a symbol of blind faith, that, that we don't always know, um, and you know, we, uh, we are blind in our faith, but, but we have to trust. And I think Ian, you know, got there, let, allowed his friend to get him there, um, and really short on the friend, uh, I think you mentioned about it, he didn't leave him, and if you noticed, he became the caregiver. Um, I think as human people, we're call, all called to be how Ryan became. Um, not the ones to be, to be cowardice and run away, but the ones to be um, courageous and, and, and care. Um, so that's what I got out of the film, and I, I really, really, really all right. <clears throat> I was going to say, I wish I had more than five minutes, but I think Frank, you know, well, he's the director, I think. <laughs> so I can take more than five minutes. But I wish I had more than five minutes because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long film. I, I understand that. Um, and uh, yet it's packed with images, with, with ideas, with concepts, with uh, a lot of messages. And for me, uh, something that came to my mind is uh, there's uh, Mercy Eliade, a, a, a philosopher, a theologian, and he says that uh, space is not the same. It's not the, space is not ordinary, ordinary space. There's space and there's a sacred space, and where the two meet, that presents, it unveils, it, 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 it shows what he calls a hierophany, a manifestation of the sacred. Uh, and to me, I saw this film as the presentation of the human drama, our life the life of the character, Ian, the central character, being played out against this backdrop of space. Uh, and at some point in the movie, he was reading a book and it was called Structured Space. And he was searching for a place. He was in search of somewhere west, uh, a place that he would know. You, you see, uh, Ryan says, you know, where am I supposed to take you? And somehow he knew uh, that was going to be revealed to him, that was going to be manifested to him. So, uh, in, in this manifestation of the sacred, that's where human uh, life is played out. There was this beautiful canvas, basically the whole world, the, the, uh, nature, the universe, where the insignificance or the seemingly insignificance of the human life takes place. And I think the, the movie presented that very, very beautifully. Um, another uh, strong and powerful image that I saw was sacramental the way in which everything speaks of the beauty of God. And, and we are the ones who enter into the sacrament. We're invited to enter into the sacrament. We're invited to enter into relationship with God. And how do we do that? We enter into relationship with God by entering into relationship with each other. And uh, the panelists here have mentioned that uh, the Ian wanted to be alone but you do not find meaning by being alone. And you only find meaning in relationship to another. Mm -hmm. uh, Pope John Paul II uh, said that we don't exist, but we coexist. We exist for the other, for the sake of the other. Uh, we enter into relationship with another. And that was very a central theme in, in, in this film, that it is not about staying within me, but going out and I think Melissa was uh, the name of the girl that says to him you know you should be careful because people are fragile in other words I don't want to be vulnerable and take you in because you're going to die yeah. and and there's a certain fear and like Frank said we we have to be that person that that's there and it's committed and uh, I'll leave you with, with this image of the Good Samaritan the Good Samaritan is the story that Jesus tells when they ask him, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And he tells them a story. And the story is about relationship. The story is about, well, something's going on and something's calling me to commit myself, to give myself to, to this situation that is happening here. But we forget that it's, the, the, it's not necessarily the one that goes out to uh, serve or to commit, which is that's what we're called to do, but it's about the other, the other that's laying there, 
the other than one that needs help. And in that encounter is where we find meaning in, in what we do. So I saw this as a whole ritual. Uh, Ian is trying to create a ritual that will bring meaning, healing, uh, and, and sense to what he's going through. And, and I think he finds that, but he, he, the, the, the ritual speaks more powerfully when he lets others in to what he's doing or what he's about. Interesting. Is there anything that maybe have, um you know, Frank has said, or Frank has said, or Jim has said, that you guys want to, you know, piggyback on, or... Um, I, I kind of want to ask the audience, well, what did you guys think about the heart box that he stole and was burying along the way? I kind of want to see if, what you guys think about that, or... Any comments? I think Steve wants to say something. I think Steve, you want to say something? Any of you guys, you guys want to... Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, Peter. Oh, okay. Peter. Oh. Uh, it's interesting when you go in life, uh, you carry stuff and you put stuff on yourself and you carry and you get this, you get that. And sometimes they don't belong to you. The things in the box, they don't belong to him. But at the same time, he felt that he had a relationship with that, with the people that meant something to him. And as he's going in, the, in his uh, search for West, is opposite to East, so he's where the, uh, where the sun dies, uh, is the other side. He is leaving behind. And this one that has the meaning, I think he makes a cross, but eventually he cannot make a cross. He, he one of them, uh, that's when uh, Ryan Coleman makes, I think, uh, another sign. But then also when he's laying on the soil, he has his person drawn by the, by the stone. Right. stone. So in a sense, uh, he is leaving behind uh, what he has carried through his life. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me, I think it's Carlos Carreto's letters to, to the desert, in which he said that he carried people of his letters to the desert, and eventually he realized they had no meaning anymore. It wasn't okay, it was uh, his love, uh, the people he loved, the relationship he carried, and things and reminders, he let them go. He was the only can let it go. As uh, so people in life, you have to let go of things and people will come on and off. Even when the two friends leave, so it's like he's letting it go and he's letting it go. And the carrying that box for me was carrying himself. And eventually, and then he was so much attached to them that he didn't want to let it go until Ryan confronts him and says, these are things. People are here. That's what matters. People, not things. And in a society that we live, we value things, what we accomplish, what we carry. Yet at the end, he's on his own. And he has to do the, 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 with the friendship, but at the same time, he dies on his own. He, he doesn't carry anything else, not even time. He goes time for now. So th that's what the bottom line is. Like. Well, what's going to be part of the thing that Orlando said that to me, it was the detachment. He wanted to detach himself from things that he thought were treasure. He didn't want Brian even to look inside the box because he felt that was part of his life, part of his treasure. But slowly, he, be, he realized this, like Orlando says, that those are only things. And that in order to accept the fact that he will die, he has to detach himself from things that at one point in his life he felt they were dear to him. After all, I have a problem with both of your positions. And that is, <laughs> first, I'll tell you why. First of all, the things were not here. I mean, one or two of them might have been. But the member of the box was of all the people who were in the group. Yeah. Number one. Number two, the acorn, which is the only thing that we understand, we're told what it is, is not a thing for thing. It's a memory, a memory of, of, of sisterhood for, for the woman, of, of good times, of, of, of love, in a sense. So it's more than that, than just a thing. Thirdly, he, when he, at least initially, when he takes these things out, he's almost creating shrines. 
I mean, this is, a, this is very much a religious kind of uh, activity on his part. He goes off into a specific wilderness place, or maybe, I'm not saying geographically, but topography-wise or whatever, and he chooses and he puts that thing, which has a meaning, and he probably knows about those meanings because he saw the stuff being put in the box, in specific places. So I, I don't think, at the end, yeah, he takes the box and puts it in the dumpster and keeps some of the stuff because he realizes that, the, that you know he's detaching stuff. But I think they have more meaning than just material things. Mm -hmm. okay. yes, go ahead, Jim. I don't want to wear it out, but there would be what he threw away at once were his own things, mm -hmm. and he put them in a dumpster. Mm -hmm. And that includes, you know, that's just stuff. But the other things were meaningful, mm -hmm. as you say, and he was respectful. And he continued, after he threw away his own, he continued to use the other symbols. And it was a, a sign of, for me, a sign of respect. He had, for what was important to inside of people. And there is an importance to life. There, there are many things which are very important. And they might be represented by an acorn. In the case of the young lady, who took it from a tree, which actually grew from an acorn they had also. So there's that continuum of life. And you see that while he's going through his, his uh, passage into the other world, you see the birds, you see the life, you see life continuing, water running, life continues. Life goes on, the train's going on. All the while that he is progressing. And then when he asks the one question, why? Why? And at the end he said, this is here. And before he says that, he said, you never left me. So I think, I thought, or I thought, I'm not that. Is it Brian or Ryan? I don't Brian, know. Brian, Brian. Brian. I just wanted to jump back to something that Frank said about um, the orbs, the lens flares, um, that there was a lot of them in this movie. And I, I read a great article once by J.J. Abrams, who had, like, directed the Star Trek reboot and, and a lot of great movies. And to him, he uses them a lot. And he said once, um, to, for him, it represents that there's something off camera, something, something that is controlling the destiny of your characters. And, and it's definitely a theme in everything he's ever done, like Lost and Star Trek and, and everything he's ever produced. And I was thinking about it in this movie also. It's like in key moments, there's just this force emanating off camera, something, something greater, you know, some un, uncaptured image that is just guiding the destiny of, of the character, of where they're going, sort of thing. So I just somehow it equated to everything I've ever seen J.J. Abrams produce. And it definitely comes through here also.